Now, with coverage you trust, this is 10 News Conference. The Obama administration decides to delay a key part of the Affordable Care Act and Republicans wasted no time in renewing calls for Obamacare to be done away with. The U.S. Supreme Court ruling that gutted the 1965 Voting Rights Act has the president and minorities outraged. And in Rhode Island, first there were tolls on the Sakana Bridge, then there were no tolls, and now there are tolls again. House Speaker Gordon Fox is openly being called a liar. Is his speakership all but over? Good morning, I'm Jim Cherokee, along with our political reporter Bill Rapley to talk about these issues and more. We have our uh, Robert Wagan, who's our uh, resident Democrat uh, <laughs> analyst sometimes. And we have uh, Kara Cromwell. In 2010, Kara was the campaign manager for John Laughlin's congressional bid. But years before that, she worked in the press office for the late Governor Bruce Sunland. She now runs the Cromwell Public Affairs Company in Rhode Island. Thanks for joining us. Thank Thanks you. for coming in. So let, let's talk about the Voting Rights Act first. Um, it gutted one section of it, a, a, as you all know. Is it justified, uh, is the outrage justified from the president and from minority groups? Because the, the one key part left in it is that the, these uh, um, j uh, districts still have to get federal approval if they want to make changes to uh, vote, voting regulations. Kara? Well, I, you know, in looking at the bill, it just seemed like, or in the, uh, the decision rather, uh, times have changed. And I think the Supreme Court looked at it and said that, you know, we don't need this anymore. Um, whether or not, you know, these minority groups and the White House want to express this outrage, it's, it's a Supreme Court decision. I mean, we can all disagree <laughs> when we want to. Is it going to have the practical effect that some of these minorities fear? It, it very well could have. Uh, and, and I think what has happened is we've uh, gotten to a level where in most cases it's probably not needed. But just because it's not needed right now, it may be needed tomorrow. And so by taking that section away and by taking away that kind of oversight uh, and federal interference to a certain degree or inter, inter, interjection into the process, uh, I think we leave ourselves up potentially, particularly in states like Texas and some of the other southern states, uh, that we could end up falling backward in terms of minority representation in Congress, mi minority voting uh, in districts where they really do need it. The Voting Rights Act really made a huge change, not just in voting, participation of political activities, but also in economics. What happened in many of these districts is all of a sudden you had people that were coming to the forefront politically, and they changed what happened with regard to public improvements, roads and highways and utilities and other things, they really made a big difference in those districts and jobs and economic um, uplifting for those people who lived in those areas. Could, now, this, could we slide back <clears throat> into that <throat> same kind of thing? Yes, there's a potential. Do we need it right this moment? Probably not. Is, is, is my understanding of, of this uh, decision that it will preclude uh, the need for these districts to get permission that's correct in advance right. before they make any changes but it doesn't prevent the attorney general or the federal government from then enforcing any violations of the act if those do take place but that's a long litigation process to get that done when you had the federal hammer sitting over you all the time and you had to ask permission before you did exactly something. when you have that kind of a situation it there's more response more quickly by the federal government to say you're doing something wrong versus going through the entire litigation which could take years and years and years and therefore uh, things can change so what are we talking about specifically is it is it gerrymandering is it is it redrawing districts to exclude uh, the the minority majority districts that primarily that Primarily, they, uh, and we've seen a lot of uh, gerrymandering in, uh, as of late in very Rhode conservative Island. districts. We could use it, uh, maybe <laughs> yeah. a little more oversight here. It, but it is primarily those areas of congressional districts, redrawing of district lines and representation within county seats, but also congressional seats. I'm a little uncomfortable with just focusing on these particular southern states. I mean, there could be, you know, issues in California or other places where minority populations have surged, where there maybe should be more oversight or gerrymandering like in Rhode Island. Or if you look at some of the districts in Massachusetts and what they're shaped like right now, it seems like some federal oversight maybe could be used there. I just, I don't like drawing a line, you know, north-south. At one point there was a problem there, you know, 50 years ago, so there still is. You know, if they want to look at it, look at it holistically. Well, co Congress could rectify the whole thing by redrawing the maps and, and it, it, themselves. They could they could make a law to rectify this ruling, but that chances of that happening are pretty slim, yeah. right? If their immigration act passes, that may actually have a bigger impact than even drawing redistricting lines, because all of a sudden, in many of these minority Hispanic districts in in the southern states 
are going to be far more forceful and, and important to have uh, th those voters voting for you. So that may have an impact far beyond what we think uh, the negative impact may be by, by this decision for the, the Voting Rights Act. The, the other major, uh, one of the other major rulings from the uh, Supreme Court, of course, was the uh, DOMA uh, ruling. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, you, do you think it'll prompt uh, more states, to, more state legislatures perhaps, to either put something on the ballot or act on their own to make gay marriage legal? Or do you think there'll be a backlash? Do you, do you think some of these states will even get their, their backs up even more and go the other way? That's an interesting question. Um, did you want to? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I did see a poll number that said after the DOMA decision, the number of Americans um, supporting same-sex marriage is the highest ever. So I'm thinking that it's probably will encourage more states to go ahead and legalize it themselves because it takes away the conversation in the general assemblies and the state legislators would say, oh, well, DOMA prevents this or that there is federal law here. Mm. There is no federal law here. And the, the Prop mm. 8 decision, while it was not no. uh, a direct, right. you know, it was, it was more of a standing issue, also, I think, plays into that. You know, gay marriage has been accepted around the country and it's moving forward. So the, I guess, Bob, there's like 37 states that still do not have Gay marriage. Thirteen you, have it. Uh, the District of Columbia has it, right. and I think some uh, five tribal nations also have it mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So, do, do you think some of those states, especially in the the, the so-called Bible Belt or in that area of the country, it's going to be a hard sell even in those states, no matter what the polls show, isn't it? It's, it's going to be a long process for them to do it, but eventually, I, th I think over the next decade, you will see that they will eventually approve same-sex marriage. Um, uh, Kara's right that uh, it's the highest uh, approval rating yet uh, throughout the country. And I think just eventually it will permeate the rest of the country and uh, be approved uh, state by state by state. So, so just yesterday, on a, on a different topic, just yesterday, we're taping this on a Friday, just on Thursday, the Obama administration, through a blog post, releases yeah. this kind of a bombshell and says we're going to delay the, uh, the, the mandatory uh, uh, business part of the Affordable Care Act that they have to, any companies over 50 have to uh, provide insurance for their employees. And Republicans right away pounce on that and say, see, I mean, it's not working, it's chaos, this is not going to be effective. Do you think this, this could be the undoing of Obamacare eventually? Ooh, that's tough because there's a lot of law that's written into the right. uh, undoing of Obamacare. But Congress Obamacare. gets to fund a lot of this. I do right. think um, that this could be the undoing of the midterm elections for uh, Democrats next year. Because, do you? yeah, I mean, and I think that, you know, I hate to put a little politics on this decision. But oh, no, don't go ahead. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> then I will. Um, you know, Who how, many, how many members of Congress and Democratic governors wanted to be facing the idea that all of their employers in their states. 50 or, 50 or larger, with any employees that worked 30 hours or more, we're going to be required to provide them insurance. Because 30 hours is not, you know, right. full time to a lot of folks, but that's what Obamacare said, and that's what was coming down. So turning this back, uh, they look disorganized, they look um, confused, and the employer mandate was a real sticking point for so many, you know, folks around the country to begin with. But I, you know, I think it's going to have a serious impact. But, but I, I read some statistics. I think it's so there's, the six, other way. there's six oh, million know. businesses in this country. Two hundred and ten thousand of the six million are companies with fifty or less people. Ninety-five percent of those companies already provide health care. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about ten thousand businesses out of six million that, ha that is affected by the employer mandate. But they're vocal. Right. Right. Uh, I think that it could actually have the opposite impact. It could actually delay some negativity that could have arisen out of the small business community against potential Democratic Congress members uh, because they will see that, well, it's been delayed, so I'm not as much impacted by Obamacare. Uh, so many people, including the Republicans, have already been talking about this in Washington, that this is a, a midterm uh, trick to try to avoid some uh, very negative impacts uh, to the uh, small business owners who would vote against Democratic members of Congress. And so it's viewed that way. I, I think that, um, as you said, it's a very small number of businesses. Mm. Uh, for those people that did not take out the insurance for or health insurance for their workers, they would have been fined $2,000 per worker um, or, or a fee of $2,000 per worker. Small amount of money, but for many of those people, that's a lot of money. Uh, and so. Uh, the one thing that I, I like what they're doing, the one thing I don't like is the way they announced it by way of a blog versus some kind of formal <laughs> announcement and discussion with right. business leaders and 
congressional leaders, that type of thing. That's what I think they should have done. So is this a what? temporary thing by the president? Is it something that's it's a one year delay? It's a one year delay. It's one delay until 2015. January 2015, it will go into effect versus January 2014. So what do you the, think it does to the base, though? The Democratic base? Democratic base, it doesn't do anything you think to they're, it. You think no. the folks that voted for Obama it, it's and like the passionate, it's like the tolls. you think they're still going to come out and they're going to, you know, support well, his remember folks Well, remember Obama next? in 2014. Mm -hmm. is really not on the ballot. No, his he isn't, but the Republicans be, will put him on the ballot if he continues will. to have these kind and of failures. And they'll put same-sex marriage on the ballot, and they'll do a number of other things like that. I but don't think Republicans are united in their opposition to same-sex marriage, and we saw here in Rhode Island recently, particularly. Recently. Well, I think it, you know, it depends on what Republican you're talking about, too. I mean, Rhode Island, we had the only legislative caucus around the country, the united, the only caucus of either party. The Republicans in the Senate voted all in favor of same-sex marriage. A very small caucus. Uh, hey, we, it's we, a small caucus, we have but... To, we have to take a break. Kara Cromwell and Bob Wigan are our guests today on 10 News Conference. We'll continue right now. Welcome back to 10 News Conference. Our guests today are Robert Wagan and Kara Cromwell. Let's talk about uh, the Rhode Island General Assembly. Gordon Fox, for all practical purposes, got his clocks cleaned d during this last session of the General Assembly. Uh, it was the, uh, first, it was the uh, contribution to the pension fund that he got uh, outvoted on that one. And then this toll fiasco. Uh, first, he tells the members, uh, especially the Aquidneck Island reps and senators, that uh, what you hear, anyhow, is basically if you vote for my budget, which included the the bond payment for the uh, 38 studios, don't worry, there won't be any tolls. He gets the vote, then he turns around and <laughs> says, no, we're going to put the tolls back in. What do you, what do you make, is, is, is he done? Do you think he, he, he's weakened to the point where next session somebody will take a run at him? Or if, can they? Is he reluctant for two terms? I would, he I, I don't think he can know. always I, take I a think, run I at think him. That, yeah, I think it's any You think time. somebody could take a run at him? I, I certainly, I think they could. I, I'd be interested to hear how those East Bay, le whether those East Bay legislators would hang together um, to oppose him, because that would certainly, I'm trying to remember the vote from a few years back when he was challenged earlier. I think it's, there's kind of a broader issue here, though, which is, you know, you kind of do what you can get away with, right? And I think he's, you know, right now he's done what he can get away with. He had his like signature. Studios. Well, <laughs> he kind of he had a signature win um, this year with same-sex marriage, and I think it was a big win for a lot of folks. Um, but I think he, you know, he's made noises here and there about being done anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe he doesn't so much care. The fiasco with the pension payment, I thought, was significant. I mean, I, I don't remember the last time uh, leadership lost a budget article. Yeah, um, neither do I. Do yeah. you? I mean, uh, it's a long time. Not, not in time. a budget article. It's been a, I can't remember in the last 25, 30 years that that's yeah. happened. I, I've seen some times where the vote went down and then it came back up for a vote again and they, right. won, they won the vote back again after right. a little bit of uh, arm twisting and sausage making and things like that. But uh, it hasn't been a smooth session. Um, the, the last month and a half, two months have really been chaotic for Gordon. Um, I, I don't think uh, he will be challenged uh, within the next year. There may be a lot of rumbling. Uh, you know, Patrick O'Neill and some of the other people that have been out there talking about wanting to be uh, the next Speaker of the House. Uh, he's, I think he stays on. And this always happens at the end of a session, a lot of chaos, perhaps not as greatly as this session has been. Uh, but then they come back in January. Uh, they've had enough time to mend the fences and do some of the things. And the leadership will be strong again in January uh, because Gordon will still be there and his leadership will still be there. And I think, you know, it's also his style. He doesn't necessarily have to have everybody on board. And he, he's okay with a little bit of dissent. He, you know, a little back and forth. He seems to enjoy the banter. Um, you know, he laughs a lot while he's up there. So, I mean, he may not need every vote every time. And um, so maybe the... It's interesting, though. There's a, a couple of times in his last few days, he's actually yelled from the dais, yeah. shut up and sit down. <laughs> right. I mean, that, I think he told someone to eat cake it, last night if yes. I was reading the Twitter feed right. properly. And that person said, you eat it yourself. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Having, having served there, it's not unusual, though, this tension, particularly during very difficult economic times. The 38 Studios was really a major issue that wore a lot of people out. Right. They uh, were deceived by earlier votes. Uh, they now had to bail it out. 
Uh, there's a lot of question about the moral obligation of paying we'll the bonds. do you think we'll ever find out what happened? Because no one still knows how that deal went down specifically. You'll never find out. What about the, don't the lawsuit, don't you have hope mm -hmm. that the lawsuit might reveal An some of that? An investigation, maybe. In generalities, but not in specifics. Because uh, there'll be a settlement? I mean, if, if it were to go to trial, then we could get the play-by-play. -play Possibly. Possibly, if the play-by-play -play is documented, if there's someone talking about exactly what went on in a particular room and the conversation is going to be hearsay. Uh, at the end of the day, the, uh, the state of Rhode Island is on the hook for over $100 million of moral obligation to pay those bonds. Um, their bond rating will stay uh, solid where it is right now and it won't go down. And they'll be able to continue on and do other things outside of 38 Studios bonding-wise and uh, be clean with uh, Stand and Poor's and Fitch and Moody's and all the rest but of it. But isn't that one of the biggest scams that's ever been perpetrated on this state, this deal it Got put together in secret. It's no yes. doubt it was in secret. Involving probably less yeah, than five people. Five people, right? And yeah, getting, five, six and people, getting right. 100 votes. Uh, it it out goes of two to chambers. the old thing that we've always tried to, unfortunately, and I don't know why people think this, that there's a silver bullet out there. There's something out there that's <laughs> going to save this right. state Magic all beans. in one or big. Bloody sock. Right? Yeah. You know, yeah. companies like Brown and Shop, Hasbro, and other companies that we are familiar with grew up from the bottom. CVS was a very small store right. in Wisaka, Rhode Island, that grew from the bottom up. It wasn't something that came in and just dumped itself on the on the state of Rhode Island. Yeah, but see, I, th I think you're missing the point. So so Don Kacheri and Gordon Fox are looking for a silver bullet. What they did was dis uh, dissemble. I mean, the, the right. with the legislature voting for that, only I think only Watson voted against it. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, the only one. Because, and none of them knew about 38 studios. What I'm surprised by is that we haven't heard more from or criticism of Don Kacheri in all of this because he really was the key player behind all of this. One of the oh, key I think he got there. raked over the coals. I, I, I think well, the for about a day or two. Yeah, and then he went away. And, and, and he's given no interviews. And he, went he, to gave one, he gave one fluff interview to a TV station where <laughs> the he other never really. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> we wouldn't have let him go. Yeah. <laughs> I know. He would have been on top. I, I think more Echoing. than anything else, it would, you know, and I, 38 Studios is just kind of one thing. It, it's a huge thing, but it's one of many embarrassments that kind of goes on in the General Assembly. But, and, and this is... And, Calamari, and it's, it's, dogs and laps. I mean, we've got a lot of things we spend a lot, an awful yeah. lot of time talking about, and maybe we should focus on investigating 38 Studios rather than talking about Calamari and dogs and laps and you know, not resolving some of these huge issues that the business community has wanted. Yeah, I don't see the Attorney General asking for an investigation. <laughs> We've got to take another break here. Cromwell and Robert Wigan are our guests today. We'll be right back. This program again on our website, turn2ten.com. We also have an archive of past programs. Click on politics. <laughs> Welcome back to 10 News Conference. We're speaking with Kara Cromwell and Robert Wiggins. So let's talk politics. First of all, are you going to run for governor in no. 2014? You're no. not. Totally not. I know you want me to, but I said no. Let's talk about this uh, possible three way Democratic primary between Chafee. Providence Mayor uh, Angel Tavares and Gina Raimondo. Who do you think is going to win that, if if that happens? Because Angel has not announced yet. I think I'd, it, you know, it, and I don't. The treasurer hasn't announced no, either, hasn't. to no. my knowledge, right? And I think I'd put government. my money on her, though. If yeah. I, yeah, um, mainly because she's raised a lot of money. Mm. Um, I think she can demonstrate uh, that she's been a leader. Um, you know, I think Tavares has a mixed record in Providence. I think Chafee has a. An extremely mixed record <laughs> in Rhode Island. It's very diplomatic. I'm well, trying to be diplomatic. Let me, let, let me ask you, Bob. What the you know the behind the scenes party apparatus? Do you think they will work to um, clear the field so only one of those three is actually? I, I don't think they can, Bill. Uh, I, I think it's going to be up to the three principals to make their decision what, what they want to do. And it won't be a party leader, uh, party chair, or some uh, political backers that will say, "Look, uh, we just need one person." Uh, if Angel Tavares decides to run, and I understand he is really hedging that way, he really does want to run, I, I, the, the traditional wisdom is that he and Link Chafee rip apart the, the labor vote, uh, which is a good segment of the Democratic primary. That gives way for Gina Raimondo to take the majority of the votes that are left, and she could easily win. But, but, but Kara, doesn't, doesn't Link Chafee have a problem with labor, too? Because all Gina Raimondo oh, yeah. has to do is run a commercial with his arm around her signing the pension reform bill. 
I, I mean, I, he's not he's not a labor favorite. I don't and I and I don't pretend to speak for um, labor, but I've got to believe that they would be angrier with him than they would be with her because when she ran for office. She didn't make any promises. She didn't say, I'll protect your pensions. In fact, I read that she didn't fill out the NEA survey. You know, she, she made no bones about who she is. On the other hand, I think Chafee did reach out to labor and has since tried to mend those fences. I, I've got to believe he's got a problem with labor. And I've got to believe that, you know, just looking at who your traditional Democratic primary voter is, if you've been a traditional Democratic primary voter for generations, You've never seen a Chafee on your on your ballot, and you've certainly never, you know, flicked the master lever for a Chafee. But if you're so, liberal, yeah, but if you're the, liberal, the Democrats you're... have voted for Chafee in strong yeah. numbers in the past. And uh, while I would agree that maybe just Chafee in the last is cycle. going to have some negativity within the Labor Party movement, if he and Ramondo went in, and the alternative is Tavares, Labor then migrates, I think, more to De Tavares than it does to Ramondo. But don't forget. The women that vote in the Democratic primary are a hefty and strong mm -hmm. number and, and a voice to be reckoned with. And so the gender issue is certainly going to be an issue for um, the two of them mm -hmm. versus Gina Raimondo. And she'll pull, pull in women's vote just because of the gender issue. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that I think if there's a three-way race, uh, I think Gina Raimondo right now, today, could win that. You think she's, a liberal, lot of, that, she's liberal enough for that Democratic base that goes out? Yes. It doesn't just have to be the Democratic base either. Is we've got open well, primaries, so you've got 150,000 in independent in Rhode Island voters that could vote. And this state has never really gone for a true liberal Democrat. Look what happened to Merth York. Got killed well, in Bruce the general Sunland. election, well, but in the Bruce primary Bruce, they did. He was, no, that's right. what I'm saying. He's yeah. the last, right. you know, He's a businessman. Businessman. If right. you put him on the spectrum right. of who he ran against, he would have been the most conservative, conservative of right. the three. But in '94, Bruce Sunland and, and Murth York, when they were run against, uh, she was the liberal of the Democratic Party. Right. She came out of the primary and right. beat an incumbent governor yeah. and, and ran for it, and then lost that in lost. the general election. So right. the general is a different story. But who would be the general election uh, potential candidates? If it is Gina Raimondo on the Democratic side, you've got uh, Ken Block and potentially Alan, Alan Fong. Fung. And mean, therefore, right. the business community, independent community, and women's vote are going to be for Gina Raimondo. So if we have a three-way Democratic primary, as we're talking about, Gina Raimondo could end up being the governor as a result of that three-way primary. And not disparaging uh, Alan Fung's possibilities or Ken Block's possibilities, but they, they, and I think anyone would consider them long shots. So whoever wins the Democratic primary is likely going to be, I think, the next governor. Right? You know, I think, you know, I completely agree that uh, agree. the treasurer has the, the best shot here, and I, I agree with the path he's laid out here. Um, but if, you know, something happened and Chafee or Tavares were to win that primary, I think there is a path for Alan Fung. I do. The person with the most money in the last gubernatorial election did not win. Mm -hmm. At this point in time. Right. So money, right. uh, while there may be a lot of money bankrolling Gino Raimondo right now, that's not necessarily an indicator of a, a winner. There's a lot of water that's going to pass under this bridge for between now and next November. Including a decision on whether that pension reform stands legally. Right. That's true. And if the, if the court overturns it or if it goes out, but more than likely that court decision is going to go past the next election, past November 2014. Um, so. I would say between now and next March, this is going to be where you're going to see people maneuver and position themselves in issues that are brought up. And how much money you have is really how much money you can raise uh, to run ads against your opponent and raise those issues of credibility of your opponent uh, and, and then your own credibility, of course. But So I, I think there's a lot that's going to happen between now and then, and it's far too early to p pick a winner. And we're out of time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Kara Cromwell and Robert Wagan. For Bill Rapley, I'm Jim Terracani. Thanks for watching this edition of 10 News Conference. Have a great Sunday.